Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by Earth Mamas Apothecary and LittleShaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. Today I wanted to talk to you about how pathologically narcissistic people are always in survival mode. If you are dealing with a narcissistic person, this is very important to understand, so I thought we could address it on the show today. People often ask why so many pathologically narcissistic people don't seem to think of the long-term consequences of their behavior. While this is a multifaceted answer, part of the reason for that is because they are in survival mode. When you're in survival mode, you are not thinking of two years from now or two months from now or even two days from now. All you're focusing on is right now. And the crisis happening right now. Getting your needs met right now. Consequences are secondary in survival mode. We can't worry about consequences right now because all that matters right now is surviving. If at some point in the future we are no longer in survival mode, maybe we can think about the consequences then. The problem is that doesn't happen. There is no future. There's only now and the endless crisis of need. People dealing with pathologically narcissistic loved ones often feel like they're stuck in Groundhog Day where it's just the same thing over and over and over again. There's always a problem. There's always a crisis. There's always an emergency. Or conversely, there's never a crisis and never an emergency because the narcissistic person doesn't care about anything at all. The narcissist never seems to get tired of this. It's like they don't even realize it. And it's safe to say they probably don't. To them, it seems that every day is a fresh horror filled with losses and landmines and the desperate search for self-worth and fulfillment. The focus is on just making it through day-to-day life. This is something that many of them have a huge amount of difficulty with, and their coping mechanisms are primitive at best. This is one reason why they are so results- or reward-driven, no matter what the cost. For a narcissistic person, the ends justify the means. They're just trying to survive. They need what they need, and anyone or anything that gets in their way is expendable. If you were starving and you needed to steal food to eat so that you didn't die, you would do that. You wouldn't care that you were breaking the law and you wouldn't care about the situation of the person you were stealing it from. In survival mode, all that matters is your own life. This is how they see things. Their mindset is such that they have to do these things to survive and when someone exists in that mentality, nothing is off limits. The problem is, narcissists are in survival mode, but they are not in a survival situation. There's no competition for resources, no need to fear that their survival is in question, yet they conduct themselves as if these things are true. They behave as if there are nonstop imminent threats to their well-being, especially to their emotional well-being. It's not unlike the particular type of food aggression that we see in dogs that have been neglected and starved. This is not the only cause of food aggression in dogs, of course, but it is a legitimate one. If a dog was in an abusive situation long enough, he will have learned that food resources are not stable or reliable. Food might be available now, but it could become scarce at any time, and this puts the dog's survival in jeopardy. Because of this, he will gobble any food he's given or that he finds as fast as possible, and if someone tries to take the food away, the dog will growl and he will bite in order to protect his resource. This dog is in survival mode. He doesn't know when or if his next meal will ever come, so he feels an urgency and an anxiety about food all the time. He has learned that he cannot trust in a reliable source of food, therefore he secures as much as he can, as fast as he can, and if anyone interferes, even people that he loves, they will be dealt with aggressively. Another dog that tries to eat the food or dares to even come near it will be attacked or maybe even killed. This is how the dog attempts to cope with what he has learned about life. Survival mode takes over so that his needs can be met. He's attempting to protect and secure his resources because he doesn't know if he's ever going to have them again. Humans are not all that different from this. We learn things the same way, and we are imprinted by previous experiences the same way, especially early ones. Narcissists don't know when or if their needs will ever be met, and they believe they are helpless to attend to those needs on their own, so they feel a continuous urgency and an anxiety about their needs all the time. Their constant focus is, what about me? For whatever reason, early on they seem to have learned that they cannot rely on other people to care about them and they have compensated for this by focusing exclusively on their own needs to the exclusion and the detriment of everything else in the panicked belief that not to do so means these needs will never be met. This results in narcissistic people attaching astronomical importance to their own needs and perceiving any deviation from this as an attack and a rejection. Unable to attend to their own needs, they insist that others attach the same importance to their needs that they do. 
When this doesn't happen, it reinforces the idea that they are in a fight for their survival. No one will care about me if I don't care about myself. No one will care about my needs if I don't make them care. No one will recognize my needs if I don't force them to recognize my needs. Of course, in a healthy relationship of any kind, this is not necessary. However, the pathologically narcissistic person generally does not recognize this. They are locked into a certain way of being, a certain mode of operation. They know no other way to be, and to abandon that would be tantamount to saying their needs don't matter at all. For most narcissists, the only way they see out of survival mode is death. The idea that there is another way to live is totally foreign to them. It's like if someone was trying to tell you to breathe through your ears. It sounds preposterous, and more than that, it sounds impossible. To the pathologically narcissistic person, it also sounds like a trick. You're trying to get them to stop focusing on their needs so that their needs are not met. Now, it seems easy enough to fix this, right? Just show them that they're not in a survival situation and that they're safe. Poof, survival mode disengaged. But it's not that easy. All facts that support positive interactions with people are either twisted, reframed, or ignored by the narcissist's perception and the way that their mind works. All facts that support negative interaction and threats to survival are maximized, misperceived, and exploited. This is what happens when someone is hyper-focused on their own needs and is unable to focus on anything else. Everything is perceived as being about or to or because of themselves. There's also the matter of being unable to attend to their own needs. This is a cause of huge anxiety and alarm in pathologically narcissistic people. Again, we can look to our example of the abused dog. He cannot secure his own source of nourishment. He must wait for someone to give it to him. If he could get out of his cage, perhaps he could find his own food, but this is beyond his ability. He must simply wait, pathetically at the mercy of other people's whims. It is the same for the pathologically narcissistic person. If they could get out of the, quote, cage of their defense mechanisms and circular logic, perhaps they would realize that they can do things like self-soothe and create self-worth on their own for themselves. But for whatever reason, they cannot get out. They feel that they're like that abused dog, waiting for someone to bring whatever scraps they feel like throwing. And more often than not, in the narcissist's perception, no one comes. They are resentful of this, and even more resentful of the fact that they're relying on other people in the first place. The very fact that this has to happen underscores and accentuates their perceived weakness. If you are dealing with a pathologically narcissistic person, remember that you are likely dealing with someone who believes they are in a daily struggle for survival, who believes they are in resource competition with any and everybody around them, and who is mightily resentful of this fact. They believe that everything they do is justified because of these things. When you are just trying to survive, how can you be blamed for anything that you have done? How could you do any differently? And for the narcissistic person, everything leads back to survival. Their manipulations, their lies, their rage, their false self, everything. This is why everything is such a big deal. Even stupid things that appear to have no connection to survival at all are very significant to the pathologically narcissistic person. Every time they are told no or denied anything, it reinforces the idea that they are in this alone and must fight tooth and nail for everything they get against a world that is literally trying to kill them. Every time they are asked to consider another person, it reinforces the idea that they're unimportant and worthless. Every time someone will not buy into their projections and their false image, it reinforces the idea that they are too damaged to be loved or to matter. Small things have huge implications in the mind of the pathologically narcissistic person. The fiction that they depend on is so fragile that even the tiniest thing could upset the whole structure and down it goes. This is something that represents literal death in the mind of many pathologically narcissistic people and something they will avoid at all costs. If you are dealing with a narcissistic person, realize that the stakes are very high for them in everything. This is not a game where they can allow any other winner but themselves. If Fox is chasing Rabbit, who's going to run faster? Rabbit, because Fox is only running for his dinner. Rabbit is running for his life. I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online and over the phone Monday through Friday, so if you're interested in speaking with me, you can visit littleshaman.org and click the Book and Appointment tab to do that. Or you can use the link that's available in the information section of this video. 
You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you and have a wonderful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by shamanspiritcenter.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. Today I wanted to talk to you about narcissists and empathy. This is always a hot topic, so I thought we could talk about it on the show today. People often ask why the knowledge that they're hurting people is not enough to make narcissists stop their behavior. They point out that narcissists often hide or deny their behavior, so they obviously know it's wrong. But this question assumes that the knowledge they're hurting someone would be enough to stop the behavior because it's coming from someone who already has normally functioning empathy. People with normally functioning empathy are the ones who are asking that question. If someone has normally functioning empathy, that knowledge is all that it would take. The knowledge that they're hurting another person would trigger an emotional reaction that would create a behavioral response. This is hurting someone. I don't want to hurt anyone, so I won't do that. This happens because that person has normally functioning empathy, so the information that they are hurting another person has emotional meaning for them. If someone does not have normal empathy, that information just doesn't mean anything to them. Without empathy to give this information emotional meaning, it does not become understanding. It's just information with no emotional meaning or value. It will not create a reaction that pushes the person to stop their behavior. Just knowing that you're hurting someone else is not enough. You have to actually care about that in order for this information to make you want to stop. Without empathy, you're not going to care and therefore you will not stop unless you're forced to do so by some external reason. If someone has dysfunctional empathy, their idea of wrong is not the same as how other people see it. For example, when narcissistic people hide their abusive behavior, they're not hiding it because hurting other people is wrong. If they thought that, they wouldn't be abusers. They're hiding the behavior because they don't want to be seen and therefore shamed for doing things that other people don't approve of. These are not the same thing. When small children are caught stealing cookies out of the cookie jar, they're not ashamed because stealing cookies is wrong or disobeying is wrong. They're ashamed because they got caught doing a bad thing and now they're in trouble or people are upset with them. It's not that they think the act itself was wrong. That doesn't even enter into the equation to be considered. It's that they were caught doing something other people don't want them to do. This causes shame, which is the pathologically narcissistic person's mortal enemy. This is made evident by the fact that abusive behavior is not the only thing narcissists hide. They hide, lie about, deny, deflect, or defend anything that they think will bring them shame, even stupid things that nobody cares about. The same reason they hide abusive behavior is the same reason that they will lie and blame you for them getting the wrong kind of butter. They don't want to get caught messing up. And sadly to them, these things seem to be about the same. Getting the wrong kind of butter or forgetting to pick up the dry cleaning will often receive the same level of vehement denial and deflection that hurting others will also receive. To narcissistic people, it appears to be that these things are all the same level of wrong and all result in the same level of toxic shame. If you listen to this show with any regularity, you know that I don't believe all narcissistic people have no empathy at all. Many do seem to have some level of empathy, and that makes sense because narcissism is a spectrum. But what empathy they do have is maladaptive and dysfunctional. It does not prevent them from hurting other people. It doesn't seem to send up the internal warning flags that the rest of us see when we're going to do something that would hurt another person. This is likely because pathologically narcissistic people are in a constant state of survival mode. Empathy can actually be a detriment in survival mode. If you're in a fight for survival, empathy could result in you not getting what you need and therefore not surviving. If you've been locked in a room with another person for weeks and weeks and suddenly a peanut butter sandwich appears, identifying with that other person and having empathy for their hunger could result in your death. You need to get that sandwich and eat it. They're going to have to worry about themselves. Now, many people might say, well, I would share with the other person. Well, maybe you would and maybe you wouldn't. It's one thing to imagine the situation and another thing to be in it. But either way, you're not a narcissist. It's a mistake to project your experience or your empathy onto another person because not everyone reacts to everything the same way and not everyone has the same level of empathy. They just don't. 
Narcissistic people are in survival mode. They have always been in survival mode. And when you are in survival mode, you just can't care about how other people feel or what will happen to them as a result of you getting what you need. That's not how you survive. Many narcissists will even talk about this in a roundabout way, describing empathy or caring about others as weak or being soft. Or they might talk about their fear, which is often disguised as disgust or hatred, of appearing weak. Some might even say these things just flat out. That tells you everything you need to know. These are primitive-minded, arrested people stuck in a survival of the fittest mindset where the only way to make it is to get everyone else before they get you. There's no point in telling them that this is not how it is because they see it everywhere they look and they always have. Everything they see and do and that happens to them seems to reinforce their idea that there's nothing to be gained and everything to be lost by going soft and allowing other people to live too. If there are 10 crackers and Bobby allows Jimmy to have half of them, that's five crackers that Bobby doesn't have. What will he do when they're gone? If Bobby identifies with Jimmy, if he has empathy for Jimmy's situation, then Bobby loses something and his survival may now be in jeopardy. This can create a panic and Bobby may react with anger and violence toward Jimmy for daring to take some of them. Even worse is the situation where Jimmy has 10 crackers and Bobby has none. This is probably why some narcissists can seem to have empathy in situations where they don't stand to lose anything. If there's no threat, there's nothing to be lost by identifying with another person and whatever empathy they may possess is therefore, quote, safe to engage in. The problem is that they seem to see threats literally everywhere because of their overblown fears about survival. For whatever reason, they got the idea early on that their very survival is being threatened continuously. This mindset is extremely difficult to change because it validates itself constantly and literally anything can become a fight to the death because of it. They've got too much to lose. And anyone who has ever been in one of these situations with a narcissist can attest to the fact that they at least seem to sincerely believe that. In the end, if you're expecting empathy from someone who believes that you might get in the way of their survival, that's probably an unrealistic expectation. If you believe you will be able to convince this person that you're not doing that when they've likely spent their entire lives believing that about every situation they're in, that's probably unrealistic too. The only thing you can really do in this situation is realize the truth of the situation and accept it for what it is. I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online, over the phone, via text, via messenger, through email, and through Skype. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that. I teach workshops a few times a month, so if you're interested in seeing what we have going right now and signing up for that, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by shamanspiritcenter.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, the little shaman. May the great spirit bless you and have a wonderful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by littleshaman.org. That's me, the little shaman. Today I wanted to talk to you about one of the hardest things for people to understand when dealing with narcissists and that is probably that the narcissist behavior really has nothing to do with other people. This sounds trite, but it really is all about them. Now that can be hard to grasp because of course, if someone does something specifically to you, you're gonna think their motive has to do with you. Most of the time in life, that would be true. With narcissists, it's really not. It really doesn't have anything to do with you. They aren't really trying to destroy you because you don't matter. Now hear me out, I know. We always say their goal is to destroy people. And it is, but their motive is not just because they're trying to cause people pain. Their goal is to destroy the other person to elevate themselves. The other person is not the motive. It has nothing to do with them. You don't even register. This is not a war that they're fighting with you. This is a war they're fighting with themselves, and you're just getting caught in the crossfire. Now, that's not to say it's accidental. Not at all. But you or feelings for you or about you or against you is not the motive. Nothing to do with you is the motive. To be perfectly honest and perfectly blunt, you really could be anybody. Their battle is with themselves and their only motive is self-preservation. At first it seems like narcissists are playing games with other people, but the more you really look into it, it starts to make sense that narcissists are actually using other people to play games with themselves. 
Other people are just tools that narcissists use to either hurt themselves or make themselves feel good. Other people are literally props in their one-man show. And again, I use the word literally because that's not a metaphor. Now you might say, I'm not a prop, I'm a person. Not to the narcissist. This is something a lot of people don't understand, and that's probably because for most of us, it's difficult to really grasp that level of self-involvement. It's hard to understand a level of self-focus so deep and exclusive that other people are not only not considered, they don't even exist. They're not even seen as people at all. I don't think emotionally it can be understood by non-narcissistic people. We can intellectually understand and we can say the words, we can explain it to each other, but emotionally I think it's always going to be a mystery. As thinking, feeling, non-narcissistic human beings, we just don't get that. How can it be that the motive of abusive behavior is not solely to hurt the other person? The answer can be found by deconstructing that idea. You have to try to look at it from their point of view, and in order to do that, you have to break it down completely. For starters, we would have to realize that we're seeing the motive through our own eyes as the person being abused. This is going to be a personal perspective no matter what, because you've been hurt. We are entitled to that perspective 100% because when someone hurts you, it is personal to you. It is not personal to the narcissist, not the way that we would mean that. Why do humans want to hurt other people? Usually it's because they've hurt us first. There are also sadistic people who get off on the pain they're causing to other people. Now, while both of these seem to fit the narcissist, the truth is that neither one of them really do. It isn't you who has hurt the narcissist, and inside, they do know that. You're simply a stand-in. You're a representative for their own failure and their own self-hatred. So, although this is the motive they often claim to have, it's false. The hurt and the hatred they feel is coming from within themselves, and they do know that. Every time they attack you, all they're really doing is burning themselves in effigy. Narcissists can also often seem like sadists, and while they may at times seem to enjoy the pain they're causing, they're not really sadistic. Sadists have to see their victims as thinking, feeling humans to get enjoyment out of torturing and hurting them, but narcissists don't really operate that way. The enjoyment they're getting out of it is all self-focused rather than other-focused. They feel good hurting people because it takes pressure off of them. It's like going a couple rounds with your punching bag. It makes you feel good, but not because you hurt the bag. The bag has no feelings. You feel good because you blew off steam. Now, everyone is, of course, different, but the main exception to that would probably be the narcissistic psychopath because they operate on just a whole different level. Those are the guys that end up becoming serial killers and stuff like that. Then, after we understood all of that, we would have to understand, truly understand, that narcissists do not see people as people the way we see people as people. We see people as individuals with feelings and needs and desires, motivations, aspirations, dreams, goals. Narcissists do not see, understand, or care about any of that. And really, just saying that does not convey how empty their understanding of other humans really is. You are one-dimensional to a narcissist. Like I said, a prop. And you only matter as far as how they can use you to make themselves feel. This is not malicious. They don't see it that way because the person's life is not even considered. Nothing about you matters. Not only does it not matter, they don't even realize any of these things are true, that you have feelings and needs and desires. That's not even on their radar at all. If they are somehow forced to recognize a need or a feeling of another person, the recognition is extremely superficial and they have absolutely no interest in it or understanding of it whatsoever. The only thing they might be remotely interested in is some feelings you might have about them. To the narcissist, every other human being is a mirror they are looking into and either seeing a good reflection of themselves or a bad one. They do not see another person at all. Thirdly, after we understand all of those things, we would have to understand that when all of these previous things are true, the behavior of the narcissist ceases to be abuse in their eyes. It wouldn't matter anyway, though, because of the way their dysfunction is structured. Narcissists are under internal attack by their superego all the time. Therefore, in their mind, they can't be abusers regardless because they're victims. What we call abuse, they would call blowing off steam or defending themselves and things like that. This is very telling. The word abuse involves the acknowledged and purposeful hurting of other people. Blowing off steam doesn't acknowledge anybody else at all. 
It acknowledges only the narcissist and their feelings and their problems. And that's appropriate since that's how they see everything. How can you abuse a punching bag? You can't. It doesn't have any feelings. So in a very real way, they have no motive to destroy you because as far as they see it, you don't even really exist. Their only motive is to save, preserve, and protect themselves. We find it shocking that they can be so callous, but from their point of view, they haven't done anything odd or terrible. This is how it is. The only real problems are their problems. The only real feelings are their feelings. The only real person is them. I don't know how to explain it any more clearly than that. You can take everything I'm saying literally. Now let's be clear. This does not somehow make their behavior not abuse. It doesn't excuse anything. It doesn't justify anything. The goal of this podcast and of this whole show is to help people understand what they're dealing with. It doesn't matter what the narcissist's motive is because the end result is still the same. Whether their goal is to destroy you or save themselves, they are abusive, manipulative, and completely, totally selfish to the exclusion of everything and everybody else. Understanding their behaviors and motives can not only help you deal with narcissists better, it helps people realize that the problem is within the narcissist, not with them. This can help immensely with letting go of the hurt and the hatred so that people can truly realize it wasn't anything they did and there was nothing they could have done so they can move on to a happier, healthier life without narcissists and the baggage that comes with that. I hope this cleared a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions. So please keep those coming. You've been listening to the meditations and more podcasts brought to you by littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you and have a wonderful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the meditations and more podcasts brought to you by littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. Today I want to talk to you about power in narcissistic relationships. This is a central theme in narcissistic relationships of all types, so I wanted to address it on the show today. Power is very important to pathologically narcissistic people. They are usually extremely preoccupied with power and control. Some are even obsessed with it. To the narcissist, power is one of the only things that truly matters because if they have power, it means they're not weak or insignificant. It means they can have whatever they want. People who have power are important. They matter. They are admired or even feared. This is what the narcissist wants for themselves, and often they will do whatever they have to do in order to get that. Now, there are some narcissistic people who are extremely driven. They work hard. They're very smooth. They're very manipulative. These narcissists often rise to the position of having power over others, such as in government or other types of authority. Others may become leaders of organizations or somehow in the community. This type of narcissistic person is often more overt, and usually they will be farther down the narcissistic spectrum, even to the point of being psychopathic. The typical type of emotionally driven behavior we usually associate with narcissists may not be immediately observed with this person unless they're under an enormous amount of stress. Even then, it might not be obvious. They may be extraordinarily self-controlled and calm, even dispassionate. This is because, though emotional motivations often still exist within these narcissists, those that are more overtly emotional are usually not capable of the type of self-control that's necessary to achieve this kind of success. Someone who has a meltdown when they can't buy a pair of shoes, for example, probably would not be able to function adequately in the world of politics or as a corporate shark. There are exceptions, of course, but as a general rule, those who are more successful are usually less obviously emotional or dysfunctional. This is the more traditional understanding of narcissistic people, power-hungry, corporate, or political titans who will stop at nothing to get what they want. However, just because someone doesn't fall into that category doesn't mean they're not a narcissist, and it doesn't mean they're not seeking power. Take, for example, the narcissist who holds the entire family hostage with hysterics or violence until they get what they want. Is this person not controlling and manipulative? Are they not seeking power over others? What about the narcissist who uses sex or money to get their way? What about the narcissist who is so insecure and fragile they have to know your every move and they can't be left alone or they'll fall apart? What about the narcissist who takes control over your life, quote, for your own good because they're so concerned and helpful? What about the narcissist who uses their intelligence to trick people into doing what they want? All of these different people are doing the same thing. They're trying to exercise power over others. They attempt to do it in different ways, but that does not change the end goal. Whether they use emotion, intelligence, concern, or force, it's all the same. They are attempting to force others into doing what they want them to do without consideration for what the other person wants or would like to do. 
The only needs that matter are their own. The means they use to try to control other people will usually be dependent on what their particular strengths are, the kind of person they are, and what they have learned is effective. For example, some narcissistic people will use violence or threats to try to force other people into doing what they want. This is probably because this is what the narcissist has learned will work for them, and it's likely a reflection of their own particular type of personality. Other narcissists may use guilt or concern to try to control others for the same reasons, and some may use both or neither depending on who they're dealing with or the situation they're in. The concept of power is very, very important to narcissistic people. They often seek power just for its own sake, and dealing with them can be just one nightmare power struggle after another. They create contention and conflict over everything. Everything becomes a contest and a competition where if they're not the winner, there's a huge blow up or some other type of punishment. Most narcissists don't like their power or authority to be challenged because this creates the fear in them that they don't really have any. It gnaws at them. People with no power don't matter and this is the ultimate death for the narcissist. Death by insignificance. This is why there are narcissists who seem like they have everything they want, yet they fall apart because one thing happens that they couldn't control or one situation occurs where they feel like they lost. Pathologically narcissistic people feel very weak and helpless inside. They're not able to regulate their own self-worth and they're not able to fulfill their needs on their own. They need to dominate and control others so that they can be assured their needs will be fulfilled without interruption. People who are not being controlled just follow their own agenda. They do whatever they want to do, and this may not include attending to the narcissist's many needs. So the narcissist endeavors to make sure that people are as preoccupied with their needs as they are. They do this by creating an environment where their needs are the most important thing. The various tactics and manipulations they use are all employed to this end. If they feel it's not working, they will often rage at this slight until their needs are firmly seated in the position of top importance once again. When you're dealing with a pathologically narcissistic person, it's important to remember that they cannot feel comfortable or secure in the relationship unless you're under their control, period. If they had their way, you would do nothing but what they want you to do 24 hours a day. You would be like a doll sitting on the shelf waiting for them to come and play with you. Narcissists live with a huge amount of stress and fear because so much of their survival is predicated on controlling the behavior and emotions of other people. They cannot exert even basic control over themselves, yet they somehow believe that they're going to be able to control other people. Of course, they're not, and people generally find this out pretty quickly, and a lot of them just leave the situation. Those who don't leave often end up hating the narcissist, and in the end, the narcissist still loses. They want to be loved and admired and respected, and the best they usually end up with is someone who feels too trapped to leave. This is the difference between you and a pathologically narcissistic person. You can understand the concept of true power even if they don't. You can learn that the only power anyone really has is over themselves, and you can also learn that that's the only power anybody needs. You can be free from the emotional bondage that absolutely tortures narcissistic people every single day. And you can earn true love, true admiration, and true respect by being a person that gives these things to others rather than attempting to force them to fulfill your needs for you because you can't do it yourself. That is something that pathologically narcissistic people can never hope to achieve. I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online and over the phone, so if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, you can visit littleshaman.org and click the Bookings tab, or you can use the link that's available down in the information section for this video. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you, and have a wonderful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by littleshaman.org. That's me, the little shaman. Today I want to talk to you about the false self of the narcissist. We often hear this mentioned, but what is it really? What does it do? What is it for? The overwhelming majority of pathologically narcissistic people are the adult victims of childhood abuse, often from a narcissistic parent. And by the way, overindulgence and spoiling is abuse. They experience all the same things that victims of narcissistic abuse are familiar with. As a child, it's very difficult for them to psychologically defend against this abuse or to develop normally. Their mind is just too preoccupied with surviving. As a result of that, there are certain key steps in development that seem to be missed. The earlier the abuse or neglect occurs, the worse the problems will be. 
The inability to separate the self from external objects is probably the biggest missed step. Failure in this area is what results in narcissism and in the lack of formation of identity. The ability to acknowledge, understand, control, and process emotions is another big one. Empathy is not nurtured and doesn't develop. Healthy boundaries don't form. There are problems with schema and object permanence. Basically, we could say their mind does not develop beyond the emotional equivalent of a toddler. They cannot handle their own emotions. They cannot tolerate frustration. And they believe that their well-being is the responsibility of other people. It's very like the way toddlers are. It's the parent's job to assume responsibility for the toddler's emotions and emotional well-being because a child that young can't do it themselves. It's the parent's job to soothe and comfort the baby because the baby can't comfort or soothe themselves. Pathologically narcissistic people cannot do this either. They have primitive defense mechanisms in place instead. One of them, the main one, is the false self. It's all a very technical explanation in some ways involving the narcissist's inability to separate the self from internal objects, particularly idealized or deified objects and dealing with self-object transference. But you don't need a technical explanation to understand that when a child is abused, they end up feeling badly about themselves. Their feelings become what they've been told. Essentially, they see themselves the way other people see them, namely their parents. The adult pathological narcissist has never grown out of this immature way of functioning. As a child, they were abused and ended up with horrible feelings of self-hatred and shame. Many people who were abused as children struggle with this also, but as they grow, they are usually able to mature beyond this and develop independent self-esteem. Narcissists are not able to do that successfully. They have no way to challenge their pathologically abusive and negative inner dialogue. It comes through as absolute truth to them, something they have believed their entire lives. Nearly everything they do is an exercise in trying to shut that inner voice up. As children, because they were unable to create true self-esteem and self-worth to counteract this negativity, they created pretend self-esteem and self-worth. The child does not feel safe, and as a reaction to the devaluation and emotional neglect they're subjected to, they begin to focus solely and intensely on themselves in an attempt to deal with the hurt. They begin to overvalue themselves in self-defense to try to balance out the completely negative with the completely positive. They say, I'm worthless, but I'm not. In fact, I'm the most important thing in the world. This becomes a continuous dialogue with themselves, a war between what they're told and what they're trying to believe in self-defense. Because the abuse usually continues for their entire childhood, this creates a pattern that becomes a way of being. Adult narcissists practice this exact same primitive defense mechanism. They grow into it instead of out of it. Because of their inability to validate their own self-worth and create actual self-esteem, they have no other way to defend themselves. This is where the false self comes in. As the child grows, these beliefs about how horrible and awful they are don't go away. If anything, they're strengthened. Everything bad that happens reinforces it, no matter how silly or even delusional that that might seem. Children engage in magical thinking. That means they believe that things happen because of them. Most children grow out of this when they mature, but people who are pathologically narcissistic do not. Even as adults, they still believe everything happens because of them or what they believe or something they did. The pre-narcissistic child wants what all children want, to be loved, to be accepted, to be liked and valued. They find that they cannot achieve these things in their home, and since the parents are idealized, the child believes it's not the parents who are wrong or defective, but that they themselves are. In the movie The Crow, the main character said, Mother is the name for God in the lips and hearts of little children. This is actually a quote from Thackeray, a British novelist and author, but regardless of where you heard it, it remains true. Parents are seen as perfect and infallible to small children, so if there's a failing, the child will perceive it to be on their own part. If your parents don't love you, you must be very vile. Something must be really wrong with you. This is what the child believes. Because of this, and because they lack a true identity, the child creates a mask that they believe is all the things they are not. This is who they will attempt to present themselves as in order to receive the things they are desperately seeking from other people. It becomes a way of being, a way to circumvent their inability to achieve what they need. No one will love them as they are. They're too horrible, too disgusting, too despicable. But if they can hide that, they might have a chance. Thus, the false self is born. This is who you met when you met the narcissist. This is who shows up in public or with people that don't know the narcissist very well. This is who you spent all your time chasing trying to find. That's who you were talking about. A mask. It's a person that doesn't exist. Once you see behind that, the narcissist knows the jig is up and they believe they'll be abandoned, even if you don't really understand that what you saw behind was a mask. They feel betrayed and angry. Remember, the false self is not a performance for you or any other people. The false self is for the narcissist. 
is the narcissist protection against their own feelings. Is their way of trying to walk the walk and convince themselves once and for all that they're not all the horrible things they believe themselves to be. They need you to believe it because that helps them believe it. They also believe they will not receive the things they need from people unless they are a good person. This probably goes back to their belief that they were not nurtured or loved by their parents because they could never be good enough. Unfortunately, their definition of a good person is totally unreasonable and they can never achieve it. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody has flaws. Nobody's perfect. Because of how they were raised, pathologically narcissistic people believe, as all victims of narcissistic abuse are told, that being a regular human being is wrong and not good enough. Can't have feelings. Can't have needs. Can't make mistakes. Can't have any flaws. Any failure to adhere to this ridiculous belief is seen as an enormous failure on their part. Even smaller, unimportant mistakes cause the narcissist's negative feelings to pour through and crack their false facade in half. Their feelings overwhelm them, and this is when they engage in abuse, projection, gaslighting, manipulation, and all manner of things designed to help them deny to themselves that they did anything which proved they weren't perfect and therefore not a good person. The biggest problem with the false self is that the narcissist knows it's not real. They are resentful of it and of other people forcing them to use it. They are paranoid someone will see behind it, and they fear the consequences if that happens. They believe they'll be abandoned, and not only do they have a pathological fear of rejection and abandonment, but with no one around to validate their self-worth, they will no longer have a way to defend against the bad feelings. They are desperate to prevent that from happening. That's why a lot of their abuse and manipulation is designed to divert other people's attention away from the narcissist and onto themselves. It's a way of saying, hey, don't look over here, look over there. Anything that threatens this false self with exposure is reacted to as life-threatening because without it, the narcissist cannot get what they need from other people and will decompensate. It's a knee-jerk reaction of self-defense because they believe they're being viciously attacked. To people who don't understand the personality structure of the narcissist, this is very confusing and even frightening. What the heck are they so mad about? They're more than just angry. They are filled with shame and self-hatred that they can't confront. You dared suggest that they weren't perfect, which means that you have validated their belief that they're bad, that they don't deserve anything, and that they're worthless. This is why people are accused of saying things they didn't say. So you might say, hey, you forgot to take the trash out again. Then they say, that doesn't make me less than you, but you're right, I'm a loser and I never do anything right. And you're like, what? It didn't make any sense to you, but it didn't have to. Narcissists believe feelings are facts. They feel that way and that makes it true. Their denial makes them unable to see they're actually projecting their own feelings onto you. You don't think they're a loser and can't do anything right just for forgetting to put the garbage out. They feel that way because any flaw or mistake on their part is seen as a monumental failure. Anyone who's been through narcissistic abuse understands that feeling. It just goes around and around and around. Narcissistic abuse just begets more narcissistic abuse. The false self is the desperate attempt of an immature, childish mind to heal itself from abuse. Their only defense against this is to create a pretend world where it's not true and force everybody else to go along with that. Because of the way they developed, they're not capable of caring about the feelings of other people, nor are they capable of seeing others as human beings who matter. They're also often very, very angry and looking for people to take it out on because this helps them feel more powerful, which boosts their non-existent self-esteem. Basically, it's an abusive situation no matter what. It's a tragic situation all around, and for all the explaining that I've just done here, one phrase probably sums it up the best. Hurt people hurt people. All this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. You've been listening to the meditations and more podcasts brought to you by littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you, and have a wonderful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by shamanspiritcenter.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, the little shaman. Today, I wanted to talk to you about something that is very common in relationships of any kind with pathologically narcissistic people, and that is the fact that they don't listen, and sometimes they can even seem to be incapable of hearing you. You might notice that when you speak to a pathologically narcissistic person, though they seem to be listening and they're often even looking right at you, they then respond with something that has nothing to do with what you just said or they only seem to hear one part of what you said and somehow manage to come to the exact wrong or opposite conclusion of your words. This is often a huge problem in these kind of relationships and it is especially bad when the narcissistic person is upset. 
How upset they are often dictates how much they're able to listen, and if they're too upset, it may be totally useless to even bother talking to this person because they just cannot hear you. Many people think this is deliberate, and for some pathologically narcissistic people, it's probably true. But it also happens because their feelings are so overwhelming to them that that wave of emotion simply blocks everything else out. It can seem like they're changing the subject with their responses to you, or that they're ignoring you, and maybe they are. But often it seems that they're not even hearing you. After dealing with this for a while, you may even be able to recognize the look in their eyes when they're no longer listening to you. They seem to be listening to somebody else talking that only they can hear, and in a way they are. They're listening to the raving, screeching voice of their own feelings. For a pathologically narcissistic person, feelings are facts. Instead of being able to view their feelings objectively as temporary reactions that may or may not be logical, their feelings are interpreted as factual. In practical terms, this means they fit the facts to their feelings rather than reacting emotionally to the facts. To put that into perspective, most people don't get upset until something happens or is done to them. Narcissists are already upset, and because of that, they become convinced that something must have been done to them to cause those feelings. This happens partly because narcissistic people are so divorced and separated from their feelings through years of denying and avoiding them that they can experience their feelings as coming from somewhere outside themselves. This is why they'll say things like, I know you hate me, I can feel it. And you're sitting there like, okay, well, you're not getting that from me because I don't hate you. That's their self-loathing, their own self-hatred that they feel. In other words, in these situations, they don't recognize that these feelings were already there and they're not even related to the situation at hand. They become triggered and offended or hurt so easily that the feelings they already feel break through at the slightest provocation and then they blame the other person for causing them to feel the way they already felt but have been denying. For example, if you say, why didn't you wash the dishes? The shame that the narcissistic person already feels breaks through their denial. This can cause them to lash out at you angrily in self-defense, accusing you of trying to hurt them, to make them feel bad, of demeaning or degrading them, or any number of other things, not because of what actually happened or what was actually said, but because of that shame that they're constantly carrying around. This can be very hurtful and stressful to a partner or a family member who in no way meant anything like that and certainly was not trying to be mean. And now there's no reasoning with the narcissist because they are far too upset. They will not listen to anything other than what their feelings are telling them. Proof doesn't matter. Logic doesn't matter. Nothing matters except for their feelings. It's like dealing with a little kid. In some ways, although I certainly understand why people feel this way, it's almost weird for me to hear narcissists described as these apex predators. These are some seriously fragile people. They can't live in reality. They can't face the truth. They live every single day playing pretend like a child. They feel hurt and offended and attacked by almost everything anybody says or does, sometimes even things that are complimentary or kind. And why? Because their feelings dictate their reality instead of the other way around, and they seem to have no way to recognize that this is a problem. Most people operate like, you said something mean, therefore I'm upset and angry. Narcissists operate like, I'm upset and angry, therefore you said something mean. It's backwards. Events, actions, and things that are said are interpreted through the lens of the narcissist's feelings. Because of this, events, actions, and motives will often be reframed to fit the narcissist's emotional narrative. Seen through the lens of this emotion, things that happen or that other people do and say often become much more sinister, suspicious, and personal to the narcissist than they actually are. This is one reason why people are often accused of having motives they don't have or of saying and doing things that they did not say or do. This is also one of the big reasons it's impossible to reason with pathologically narcissistic people, especially when they're upset. They can't even really hear what you're trying to say, and even if they could, they're certainly not going to trust you over their own feelings, which override literally everything. Sometimes they can't even get what they are trying to say to come out right. Narcissistic people have immense difficulty communicating with any authenticity because everything coming in and going out has to go through that emotional filter. More than that, since their feelings are interpreted as factual, those feelings are considered evidence. This must be true because I feel it. The proof that you were intentionally trying to hurt me is that I feel hurt. The proof that you are tricking me is that I feel tricked. The proof that you are cheating is that I feel like I've been cheated on and so on and so on and so on. 
There's no way to communicate in this situation because the premise of the conversation and the issue are illogical. It's you trying to talk this person out of their feelings, feelings they often had no logical basis for in the first place. Not only is that not possible, but it can make the narcissist feel as if you're trying to manipulate them. Narcissistic people have huge issues with trust. They don't even trust themselves. So they're generally in a constant battle between trying to determine what is safe and what is not safe. One moment they trust you more than themselves, so you're a safe place. The next moment they trust themselves more than you, so now you are not a safe place. In situations such as our example about the dishes, if they were to believe you over their own feelings, that makes them vulnerable to you and whatever evil things that you're probably going to do to them at some point, possibly, maybe, they're for sure. That can't be allowed to happen, and it won't be allowed to happen. Even tangible, physical proof does not matter to them in these situations. They are so worried about being tricked and about not being wrong that they can appear almost delusional. So you say, yes, but here's a video of what actually happened. Oh, you edited that to make me look bad or to make yourself look better. Yes, but here's a picture of you doing this thing that you said you didn't do. You faked that to make me look like a liar. Yes, but here's a message in your own words. You wrote that and sent it to yourself to frame me. There's no reasoning with this. It's illogical and it's ridiculous. The overwhelming emotions coupled with their fear of being vulnerable and taken advantage of, along with their pathological need to be right, or more precisely, not to be wrong, make communication with this kind of person impossible. You are not on a level playing field at all. Whether they realize how absurd their arguments can be is a difficult question. Some probably do, but they might feel they've gone too far with it to simply just give in, no matter how stupid it sounds. Others may be in the grip of whatever emotion they're feeling and just running off at the mouth without even really realizing what they're even saying. Some may believe that they're smarter than the person they're arguing with and can somehow make these ludicrous arguments work, while others may be making these nonsensical arguments because that's literally the only thing they have left to say. It doesn't really matter whether they know they're doing it or not or why they're doing it or anything else. It isn't possible to communicate with someone who cannot or will not listen to you, and it doesn't really matter why. The naked truth is that even if you could make them hear you, they still wouldn't care. I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online, over the phone, via email, via text messenger, and through Skype. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, -on -one, you can visit littleshaman.org to go ahead and do that. I teach workshops a few times a month. We have the Boundaries Workshop and the Shadow Workshop running right now. So if you're interested in learning more about that or signing up to participate, you can do that on littleshaman.org as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by shamanspiritcenter.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you and have a wonderful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. Today I wanted to talk to you about the narcissistic person's need to win. This is something that virtually everybody encounters when dealing with pathologically narcissistic people, so I thought we could talk about it on the show today. You might have noticed that narcissistic people have a problem with losing. They're almost phobic about it. They will do anything to win, including lie, cheat, steal, and even kill in some cases. Everything becomes a competition where they have to somehow come out on top, even basic conversation or situations where others agree with them. They have a huge problem with admitting and accepting that they're wrong or mistaken, and they will often go as far as possible to deny facts, proof, or anything that contradicts what they're claiming, even if this means they have to venture into arguments that sound delusional or make total fools of themselves. Conversations with pathologically narcissistic people can resemble high-stakes debates or prosecutions in a court of law where people are grilled relentlessly over minor details or become lost in semantics and word salad. What was said, explaining what was said, what was meant by what was said, tone, inflection, word choice, motive, and much more become the focal point of the interaction instead of whatever the actual point of the conversation was. The point itself is, of course, hopelessly lost, buried under the two tons of crap that the narcissist has heaped upon it in the hope of never having to face, acknowledge, or resolve anything. They don't want resolution. They want conflict. Every conversation, every argument, every interaction becomes a contest that they must win at all costs. This is extremely frustrating for people. 
The goal of communication for most people is to understand, to be understood, to resolve conflict, to gain knowledge, to solve problems, to share. None of these things are possible with pathologically narcissistic people because nothing they're saying is genuine in the sense that most other people understand things to be genuine. After a while, you realize that even when you're not arguing, they're just playing you. They're trying to win this contest they've created in their mind, and whatever they have to do or say in order for that to happen is what they will do or say. This is why people become so exhausted from these interactions and why the narcissist doesn't become exhausted. They're getting supply and a rush from the competition, from the promise of a win. They're chasing that rush. They're playing a game just like someone who's gambling. It's very similar, in fact, to gambling. The other person has a completely different goal than the narcissist. They're desperately trying to be heard and solve a problem. They're choosing what to say very carefully. They're focusing intently. They're concentrating. This is exhausting. And narcissists sit there soaking it all up and pulling on the arm of that emotional slot machine they're playing with, hoping this time the other person retreats and they can come up with that jackpot win. Even if you're not fighting with the narcissist and just trying to hold a conversation, they're often contradicting, one-upping, condescending, bluffing, preaching, sermonizing, correcting, complaining, and confabulating. This is exhausting as well. You may feel like you're always defending, even during seemingly regular conversation and even when the narcissist is not angry. Because of these things, it's important to understand that it's basically pointless to bother trying to reason with someone who's pathologically narcissistic. All they care about is winning. If they're wrong, if they're mistaken, if they're flawed, if they lose, then they're not perfect. Narcissists believe if anyone, including themselves, is not perfect, that person is worthless. In order to be perfect, a person must be always right, always flawless, always important, they must never fail, and they must never lose. The act of being wrong, of losing, often triggers a tidal wave of shame and self-hatred for pathologically narcissistic people. To be wrong is to be imperfect. To be imperfect is to be garbage, unworthy of love or anything else. The only way they can counteract or prevent these feelings is to make sure they're never wrong and they never lose. Of course... This is ridiculous and unreasonable, and it's one of the reasons dealing with pathologically narcissistic people is so difficult. No one's perfect. No one is flawless. No one is always right. No one always wins. Dealing with a person who's trying to force you into living that delusion as a reality is torturous, and ultimately, it's impossible. Somebody has to be to blame when the narcissistic person is inevitably wrong, mistaken, or flawed, and if it can't be them, it's going to be whoever's convenient. That's you. After all, you can't be right unless somebody else is wrong. You cannot win unless somebody else loses. These are people who have nothing of their own. Narcissists have nothing of their own. Anything they get must come at the expense of somebody else. Always. The knowledge that narcissistic people need to win is really, really important because it helps you to understand what the stakes are during every single interaction with this type of person. This is someone who too often takes even a simple conversation as a contest they must win in order to prove to the world and to themselves that they deserve to live. This type of thing is the only way they can create self-worth. It's the only power they are capable of grasping. It keeps the self-hatred away. It validates their existence. It sustains them. In other words, this need to win is really, really important and it is not going away. This is how they have learned to deal with life and get their needs met. Remember that when you're dealing with someone that you believe is pathologically narcissistic, they're not working toward resolving problems. In fact, what you believe to be the problem is probably not anywhere close to what they think it is. Their way of thinking is not your way of thinking. Their goals are not your goals. Their motives are not your motives. This is a person who, in some ways, operates completely differently than you do. Attempting to deal with a narcissist without truly accepting and understanding this only leads to problems. Reality needs to be accepted here, otherwise expectations are going to be unrealistic and that leads to hurt, disappointment, and unhappiness. If narcissists need to win so badly and the only way they can win is if you lose, perhaps the best decision is simply not to play.
I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online, over the phone, through text, via email, so if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, you can visit littleshaman.org and click to book an appointment tab to go ahead and do that, or you can use the link that's available in the information section of this video. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you and have a wonderful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by littleshaman.org. That's me, the Little Shaman. Today I wanted to talk to you about the three reasons narcissistic people discard others. This comes up in most people's relationships eventually, so I thought we could talk about it on the show today. If you've been trying to learn about narcissism, you've probably already heard about the dreaded discard. You may have even experienced it. To discard something means to throw it away, and discard is usually the final stage of the relationship with a pathologically narcissistic person. There are three stages in these relationships. The first stage is idealization, where the other person is idealized by the narcissist as perfect and amazing and wonderful, a soulmate, a kindred spirit, the only one who understands. This lasts for varying periods of time and is usually characterized by love bombing, which is exactly what it sounds like. The victim is bombarded with affection, concern, and all of the things that they believe they're looking for in a relationship. This stage is usually intense and moves very quickly. People feel swept off their feet. And though they might notice red flags in this stage of the relationship, they're more likely to ignore them or try to explain them away because the rest of it is just so wonderful and amazing. The second stage of the relationship is the devaluation stage. This is when the honeymoon is over. No longer perfect in the eyes of the narcissist, the other person now finds themselves to be the target of the narcissist's rage or condescension, frustration, fear, hysteria, or varying other types of abuse. The devaluation stage often starts slowly, getting worse and worse over time until the person finds they can now do nothing right. Everything they say is wrong. Everything they do is bad. All their motives are evil. All their feelings are hateful when their feelings matter at all. The perfect partner has now become a perfect nightmare and the person just can't figure out what's gone wrong. Adding to the confusion is the fact that most relationships with pathologically narcissistic people swing back and forth between idealization and devaluation. One minute you're the greatest thing that ever happened to them, the next minute you've ruined their life. If you throw in a few epiphanies, which are those moments where the narcissist seems to suddenly see the light and realize everything they've done wrong, and it's no wonder people are so confused and unsettled by these relationships. The alternating between idealization and devaluation can go on for years, often with the idealization stage becoming shorter and shorter until the relationship is nothing but nonstop abuse and problems almost every day. The narcissist is combative all the time, accusatory, aggressive, provocative, and nasty, or maybe they're silent and cold, ignoring the other person completely except for when they want something. There may be a break in the devaluation when the narcissist feels insecure or when they want something, but mostly the relationship is abusive and invalidating. There is no set time limit for how long this can go on. In some situations, it ends in discard within six months, and in some, it can go on for like 30 years. When discard does occur, it's usually for one of three reasons. Number one, The cycles and the victim have ultimately become so boring to the narcissist that they don't care to engage anymore. Number two, the victim is so burned out and emotionally bankrupt that they no longer react to the narcissist's endless provocations, which causes the narcissist to lose interest. Or number three, the narcissist has found a new source that isn't wise to their scam yet. When the cycles or the victim have become boring, narcissists will likely look for something else to stimulate them. This could be new people, new situations, new drugs, or anything else that will light up their dials. The same old arguments or control over the same old person or people just isn't satisfying anymore. It may be that they've broken the person down so completely there's no challenge. Or conversely, that they've never been able to assert control over the person and have decided that it's not worth bothering anymore. Many narcissists are a paradox in that regard. They would like somebody to be submissive and easy to control, yet they often lose interest when that happens. In this same way, if a person will not knuckle under at all, they can lose interest in that as well because they're not getting what they want. 
if the person becomes so emotionally bankrupt and burned out that they're no longer able to react the way that the narcissistic person wants them to, this can also result in the narcissist losing interest. This happens all the time. You can only listen to the same hysteria and threats for so long before it just stops upsetting you. Your body cannot stay in such a heightened state. It gets burned out and stops reacting. When this happens, it's often taken by the narcissist as a sign that someone no longer cares for them and that they're not important to the person or in the situation any longer. They want people to react to them, to their tantrums, to their provocations, their silent treatments, their nasty little comments. They use this to gauge how much they matter. If someone stops reacting, a pathologically narcissistic person will often take that to mean that they no longer have any power or control in this situation and are no longer important. They would then be more likely to seek out a situation where they can feel those things again. Regardless of how bored or unimportant the narcissist feels in their current situation, however, they are unlikely to leave it if they don't have a new one lined up. Narcissists use other people as resources to obtain attention or energy from them, which is often called supply, that they can then process into self-worth because they have no way to create or sustain that on their own. This is absolutely vital to their survival. Narcissistic people that are cut off from supply bottom out and decompensate, often becoming suicidal or breaking from reality and becoming psychotic. Because of this, Bad or weak supply is better than none at all, so they are unlikely to leave without a new resource. Now sometimes, even if the relationship has not gotten boring, a narcissist will jump ship for a new source of supply simply because the new one is not tainted by imperfect opinions of them. Once the initial perfect idealization stage of the relationship has ended and devaluation has begun, when the honeymoon is over, in other words, narcissists may jump at the chance to gain supply from a new perfect source. Not only does the old source of supply see the narcissist as flawed and no longer perfect, the narcissist sees the source of supply as flawed as well. In a relationship with somebody other than a narcissist, this would be fine. It happens all the time. It's normal, it's natural, but for narcissistic people, it's intolerable. A new person or people who have no previous experience with the narcissist and therefore no negative ideas about them is seen as ideal, just as the victim was initially seen as ideal. The narcissist will likely eventually destroy this new relationship or situation too, as they do with all the others in their life. But until that happens, they would prefer untainted, perfect supply over any other. That's why the supply of strangers is often more important than the supply of the narcissist's family. Those strangers know nothing about the narcissistic person and therefore they have no bad ideas about them. The supply that comes from strangers is more pure than the supply coming from people that know who and what the narcissist really is. It supports the false self that they project onto the world because these people have no way to know the truth. Regardless of the reasons they give, the truth is that pathologically narcissistic people only have relationships in order to gain this attention or this energy that they can process into self-worth. There's no other reason. They're not interested in companionship or friendship for its own sake, and they could care less about the needs of other people. Therefore, if the supply runs out, their interest in the relationship runs out too. Sometimes people try to be the perfect supply in the hopes of keeping the relationship going, but they soon find out that there is no such thing as that. Part of the reason you're in the relationship at all is so that you can be the scapegoat for everything the narcissist needs to blame on other people so that they can still keep believing in the false persona they project onto the world. As far as they're concerned, they're not mistaken or wrong or incorrect or abusive or stupid. You are. Because of this, you can never be seen as perfect. Ever. If you've been discarded, remember that it has nothing to do with you or who you are and everything to do with who the narcissist wishes they could be. I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. 
I take appointments online, over the phone, via email, via text. If you're interested in speaking with me, you can visit littleshaman.org and click the book and appointment tab to go ahead and do that. I am now giving workshops once a month, so if you would like to check those out, you can also visit littleshaman.org to do that, or you can use the link that's available in the information section of this video. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by littleshaman.org. That's me, Little Shaman. May the Great Spirit bless you and have a wonderful day. Hey everybody, it's Shaman Sister Sin, and you're listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by shamanspiritcenter.com and littleshaman.org. That's me, the little shaman. Today I wanted to talk to you about the motivations of pathologically narcissistic people. This is something many people wonder about, so I thought we could talk about it on the show today. The behavior of narcissistic people can be very confusing. This is often because it's hard to figure out why they're doing things. When asked, their stories often make no sense at all. They may give reasons that blame others, that seem to confuse cause and effect, that misrepresent the order of events, or just plain make no sense. Part of this is because many narcissists don't want to reveal their true motivations. They fear showing vulnerability or how their true motivations will make them look to other people. It also can be because they're often so disconnected from themselves internally and so lacking in insight that they don't really know why they're doing something. They just do what they think they need to or want to do in that specific moment. They may truly not realize why and most don't understand or care about long-term consequences. It doesn't matter if it'll hurt them later, what matters is now. That is because pathologically narcissistic people are in survival mode, as we've discussed in other episodes of the show. When someone is in survival mode, they can't worry about what will happen tomorrow. They're too worried about getting through today. This is probably the number one motivation of narcissistic people, survival. All their other motives seem to spring from this one. All of their behaviors center around this one thing. You may hear people say, for example, that the motives of narcissistic people are power and control, and that's true. But why? Why do they believe they need power and control? It's easy to stop right there and say, that's the end, and in practical terms, that's all you need to know to decide whether you want somebody in your life or not. However, it's not the end of the story as far as understanding goes. Desiring power and control is not its own endgame, regardless of the mechanics of achieving it. No matter what, there's always the question of why. There's a reason this has become such a powerful motivation in somebody's life. The answer in this case is survival. Pathologically narcissistic people are dependent on others, literally. Because of their disordered functioning, they require the participation of other people in order to function as efficiently as they are able to. When someone is dependent on others, those others have a lot of power and they become very important. This is, for example, how relationships works between adults and children. Children are dependent on their parents and other caregivers for survival. The caregivers are very important to the child because of this, and they have total control over the relationships. This is the situation narcissistic people seem to be in as well. They resent and fear their perceived lack of power in this situation because not having power means not being able to control other people. That means not getting what you need, which equals a threat to their survival. Seeking to control others facilitates their power over other people, which is really power over themselves and their own continued survival. When you can control the things you need for survival, you have a better chance of surviving and you feel less fear. Because you actually can't truly control other people, nobody can, narcissists are in a continuous power struggle with others to try to bridge this gap and alleviate their anxiety over it. This is why people must perform exactly according to the narcissistic person's wishes or they're going to be punished. When you assert identity, individuality, or sovereignty that separates you from the narcissist, you are demonstrating that they do not control you. If they do not control you, you're a threat because you may not give them what they need. Then what are they supposed to do? They have no other way to get it. It's a survival strategy designed to essentially extort what they need from others because they have no idea how to meet their own needs, no skills with which to do so, and either no ability or no desire to learn new ones. Even in cases where the narcissist is truly sadistic and torturous, the motive underneath is still usually fear, even if it's unconscious or unacknowledged. There's nobody who fears weakness and helplessness more than an abuser. Why do they desire to torture or to be cruel? To feel in control, to feel powerful. Why do they desire to feel powerful? Because they fear they're not. Those who are not in control have no power, and those with no power do not survive. 
Power can also become an addiction, but all addiction is rooted in survival and defense mechanisms. Despite their behavior, this is the mindset of a very young child who has no true control over themselves or their environment. They perceive others to be the ones with all the power and control over them, so they endeavor to take that back by exerting control over the other person or the other people. It's a system based on backward reasoning that results in them actually reinforcing to themselves that they have no power over and over again. This, of course, only makes the problem worse, not better. Creates a situation where they ultimately feel completely powerless in their own lives unless they play these power games with other people constantly and win. This is what you see with pathologically narcissistic persons, someone who is unable to feel in control and empowered in their own life unless they're degrading, berating, or otherwise subjugating another person. They can't win unless somebody else loses. They believe other people hold all the power and their lives are a constant struggle to take that power, thereby ensuring their own survival. It's a devastating situation both for them and for anyone unlucky enough to be entangled with them in this pointless power struggle that can never be won by anybody and therefore can never end. Understanding the motivations of narcissistic people can help you get unstuck and break the paralysis brought on by the confusion created by this so often nonsensical behavior. It's easy to get stuck in a loop of trying to understand and trying to explain, never realizing that neither of these things are really going to help facilitate communication at all. The narcissist has one real goal, and if what you're saying or doing doesn't help further that goal, it's getting in the way of it. Therefore, they will either defend against, deflect, deny, or destroy it, all in the fear and the resulting entitled rage that their needs are not going to be met. Now, it can be easy to mistake the narcissist's motivating fear as something which can be addressed with demonstrations of love, security, kindness, or the other normal avenues of reassurance that you would use with another person, but this is not, quote, normal fear. It is a deep, pathological insecurity centered around their own inability to perform basic survival functions or secure and address basic needs, which is wrapped in shame and obscured by denial coupled with cognitive distortions and skewed perception. We compare their mindset to children, and in many ways it's very much the same due to their arrested emotional development, but in other ways it's more like dealing with a machine that can only do one thing at all costs, and by any means necessary. I hope this clears a few things up for you. As always, I look forward to your comments, questions, and suggestions, so please keep those coming. I take appointments online, over the phone, via text, via messenger, via email, and through Skype. So if you're interested in speaking with me one-on-one, you can visit littleshaman.org to do that by clicking the Book and Appointment tab. I teach workshops a few times a month, so if you're interested in participating in one of those, you can do that through littleshaman.org as well. You've been listening to the Meditations and More podcast brought to you by littleshaman.org and Shaman Spirit Center dot com. That's me, the little shaman. May the great spirit bless you and have a wonderful day.